it's great to see everyone here today and thank you for um, joining us on this Tuesday, this Folk Arts Day of Arts Week. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to shine a spotlight on some of Kentucky's great folk and traditional artists today. So I work with the Arts Council. My name is Mark Brown. I'm the Folk and Traditional Arts Director, a graduate of the Western Kentucky University Folk Studies Department from about 20 years ago. And since that time, I've been working as a folklorist in Kentucky um, with the Kentucky Folk Life Program and in the Arts Council now. Um, it's a great organization to work for. We have a mission to foster environments for all Kentuckians to value, participate in, and benefit from the arts. And one of the ways that we work to advance that mission is through folk and traditional arts. Now, the Arts Council has uh, adopted a broad definition of folk and traditional arts. A lot of different people have different definitions or, or different things they think about when they think of folk or folklore or um, folk traditions and folk culture. But um, the Arts Council takes the approach that all of us have folk culture and we, we all express ourselves artistically in our everyday lives and the way that we communicate with our cultural groups that we all belong to, like includes our family, our work groups, and our um, recreational groups, cultural groups as well. And um, so based on that, um, folklore is really a, a living um, uh, phenomenon. It's a, not something that's locked in the past or that only certain people um, have, but it's something that all of us have, and it's something that's dynamic, and it's changing all the time. So, um, and we enjoy a good support for uh, the folk arts in Kentucky, thanks to the Kentucky General Assembly and the National Endowment for the Arts, which actually makes all of our folk arts activities possible. Um, so we appreciate support from the NEA, as well as our regional arts organization, South Arts, through which we partner on many other projects. We've done this over the years through festivals and other public events, um, traveling exhibits, um, partnerships with groups like the Kentucky Folklife Program and it's based at Western Kentucky University and the Kentucky Historical Society, our state um, government partner. Um, one of the ways that we've um, supported folk artists directly in their communities is through the Folk and Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Grant. And the apprenticeship grant has been going continuously since 1993 and has uh, fostered uh, cultural traditions within a community by allowing a master or mentor artist to teach their cultural tradition to an apprentice in their community, um, therefore sustaining and strengthening the cultural tradition as well as giving us a chance to document their, um, their experience and to share their story with others. And so we're going to talk to artists today who have been through that apprenticeship program and learn about how they're connected with their Kentucky communities and how their traditional art has taken on a, a, a life here in Kentucky and has thrived um, thanks to them and their support of, of their, uh, their apprentices. So um, uh, just to outline quickly what we're going to go over today, um, the next thing that we're going to do is an online narrative stage, and I'll tell you what a more about a narrative stage in just a moment with our artists. And then from so we'll, that stage, we'll go until 11:30, and then we'll enjoy a performance by storyteller and songwriter Mitch Barrett. We're so glad to have Mitch here with us today. And then at about noon, we're going to change over to an interview, or, or sorry, not an interview, but presentations by. Uh, farmers and community leaders, Ashley Smith of Black Soil and Michelle Howell of Needmore Acres Farm. And at that time, we'll discuss the connections between farming and folk culture. So I'm really looking forward to spending this time with our artists and with you, the audience. If you all think of questions anytime along the way, you can share them in the chat and we'll get to them near the end of each of the um, interviews or presentations. Uh, so now I'd like to go ahead and welcome you to our Culture Bearers Narrative Stage and welcome three artists, Shuling Fister, Shuling Studios in Lexington, who's a traditional dancer. And we'll welcome Justin Roberts of Walk the Willow. Justin is a furniture build, builder and willow artist based in Murray, Kentucky. And Mitch Barrett, who's a performing artist, musician, songwriter, storyteller, uh, performs with the group Zoe Speaks, and, he, and Mitch is based in Berea. 
We're so glad to have all three of you here with us today. Um, do you want to go ahead and um, test, we'll test everybody's audio if you just want to go around and, and say uh, hi and welcome everyone. Shuling, would you like to start? Hi everyone, I'm Shulin Fister and uh, I'm a Chinese uh, dance performance, performing and then teaching artist. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you, Shuling and Justin. Hello, thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Great to see you today. Indeed. And Mitch. Howdy, everybody. Howdy, it's great to see all three of you and hear you. It's, it's always a uh, comforting to know that we can uh, uh, we're familiar enough with Zoom that we can toggle our mics and uh, have this conversation virtually. Um, just want to take a moment to recognize we've, the hard year that we've all had and um, thank you all for taking time to to join this conversation about the folk and traditional arts. That's you the artists and you the audience as well. So we really appreciate uh, this coming together. Uh, so as I mentioned before this is a narrative stage so it's interactive we're going to get to hear um, you know, a conversation between these artists, but it's also uh, an opportunity for you, the audience, to type questions into your chat. Uh, we'll monitor those, my coworkers and I, and, and we might uh, ask some of them to the artists. So if you think of a good question, don't hesitate to send it in. Um, so let's just start. Um, Shu Ling, can I, can I ask you the first question? If, if we can go around and say, um, tell us about your traditional art form uh, and what, what it's like to practice it here in Kentucky. Um, and what it means to you and your community. Okay, um, I, um, my profession is like a, uh, Chinese, uh, I'm teaching Chinese dance at Lexington. I have my own studio called the Shulin Studio and mainly working on the Chinese classic on the folk dance. When uh, we have, we provide a class uh, weekly before the pandemic. But after the pandemic, we unfortunately stopped uh, most of most of the time up to today up to today so but i'm very excited that we're going coming back going back to the studio very soon um what i miss is those uh, time to meet my students and the, most of them are from uh chinese community here um we have american students we have the majority of chinese are her, like a heritage uh, girls um we normally we uh we teach a class and then we have a recital. We perform at the Chinese New Year, uh, February. This year, February, we are just right in the Chinese New Year term. In Ch Chinese New Year have uh, 15, uh, two weeks last uh, 15 days. I think yesterday's the last day of the Chinese New Year or day before. So um, I miss the time for the bigger performance annually. Um, what do we do? Um, Chinese dance, we also like a dance with uh, uh, props, uh, colorful props, and then with the splendid the colorful costumes. As you can see, some of those behind me, I set it up already have some uh, elements there. And for uh, because um, we have the Chinese population and the Asian, Chinese and Asian populations growing in uh, Kentucky and and also nationally in United States. Um, we really, we want to preserve our culture like folk dance, uh, folk, our culture. And the folk dance is the easiest way, faster way to reach out to people. And then because of the beauty inside and then each like a dance props and then the costumes has lots of uh, ethnic group elements in, within. So we are just, uh, fascinating to that our audience are my students that's how they connect to even though american of asian like a china a chinese like a heritage heritage uh people but they still want to keep whatever the ancestor those roots um i think uh thanks uh kentucky arts council to provide this apprentice uh, grant opportunity and then, so that's why we I can like uh, recruit my students and then to train more people to reach out this is uh, to people and then so we can teach more people and currently uh, we like my students like I was majority is like a young girls I have a like, tradition uh, uh, lady lady group of two adults 
And so those, I, I, I just found that recently, all my graduate high school uh, dancers, when they went to a college in national, national wide, there are still, most of them, they formed their um, dance group, Chinese dance group, always participate in those uh, club, uh, dance club. I feel so proud. It, it feels like that's uh, the root I planted. Now it's flourished everywhere. So that's so good. And then since uh, we just want to live in a harmony society, community, we don't want to hate each other. So arts, it's just no, uh, no bound from all different kinds of background. We just love to be, to, to be here, try, try to use the beauty and then those dance, carry on those culture. And then we just try to create like a harmony uh, community here. And then what uh, I have something like a, like a Chinese dance, like a handkerchief, like those one, we use people's daily, our props, one of our dance culture element, elements, we always connected to people's daily life, like a handkerchief a long time ago, <laughs> that's for, mm -hmm, just cover you. But now we use this as the dance, dance props. For folk dance, Chinese like, uh, folk dance uh, called a dai, People just love the, uh, they live in the uh, tropical area. They have lots of uh, peacock in their region. So people treat those like a worship of those peacock. So in their costumes, they in, just engrave those uh, peacock, those a little further in there. And then we have the Chinese classical. And, and okay. And um, this is the uh, organ. This is a one like a meow dance, uh, meow uh, polka dance. What their one, they in um, their costume has those flowers. This is a China, China uh, the peon is China's uh, national flower. So that's the main theme. And then this, we, we look at those two angles. That is presented like a uh, ox and a bull. That's one of the big animal in their community. They in their song and their dance, they're always just like uh, celebrated with those like a uh, cow bull. And then that might be a little bit religion uh, related. So this year's the ox, the year for ox. I thought that's very interesting. And other than that, I have a little bit of uh, video. So Mark, can you uh, sure. play that for me? That's a highlights yeah. of what we're doing. Yeah, and as I'm queuing up that video, I just wanna, um say uh, happy new year to you and uh, thanks for reminding us that it's the, the the closing of the new year celebration for the year of the ox and uh, i've seen you perform shuling you, you all do a, an excellent um performance and, and a great you're you're great at um presenting to your um to your community of chinese americans of central kentucky but also to the non-chinese folks who come to to experience your culture as well uh, you all have done a great job over the years um you know welcoming new audiences and introducing us to the traditions, uh, explaining, you know, the, the cultural background that, that we need to help us understand you understand your dance better. So I'll go ahead and bring that video up that you sent me. Let's see if I can do that. Thank you. Just a minute or two of this.
We've seen some really beautiful costumes there, Shuling, and uh, it's clear that a lot of uh, energy has gone into this uh, in probably months and months of uh, rehearsal and, and teaching. And uh, it's great to see all those different age groups involved. Um, could you uh, could you talk about, um, so you, you'd mentioned that you you kind of work with younger girls mostly and then and then get them to a point where they're ready to to move on to, to new things in their careers. And, and you've actually, with one of the, um, one of your students that you've worked with has uh, partnered with you on an apprenticeship grant. It's uh, Angie Chow, right? Yes, Angie. Did yeah, the first dance, the band dance, that's uh, her. Yeah, uh, Angie um, working with me um, for, uh, I, she danced with me for a long time since when she was a little. And then she just has a great passion for the dance. And then she especially love Chinese dance. She did some ballet before, and she been she's she, she just loved that has a passion for the uh, for the dance. And then she worked very hard. And then even I had like a high school kids, so they were just so busy. But she, no matter what, she's always available. And then regard um regarding presenting and then take the class and then teaching. She's just a wonderful girl. And what, um, I, one thing about very special made me very proud of her. And then she joined that uh, Distinguished Young Women, uh, Distinguished Young Women, that the program, national, that's the National Wild Program. And then very competitive for senior, uh, for senior girls, girls. And then she, she, I um, mean, everybody tried to do like a uh, one for the arts part and the talent, the arts part. She brought the, her Chinese, that fan dance to the stage. It's just like, wow. Not many people like in that crowd to, 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 to be at a risk, the ability, the risk opportunity to, uh, to do that talent part of the show. And then she mastered it. She did it so well and then give a, just give a lots of um, just open the mind for lots of people. So I, I feel like a very good. I, of course, she won the title for Kentucky, for the like, distinguished young woman of Kentucky. Um, uh, uh, no, no, she's runner up first. Uh, first run up, and then she, uh, she won the title at the Fayette County. And yeah, that's uh, I feel like yeah, she's she with this grants, she stepped in much more and then so she developed the more those uh, teaching style those cultural elements and then she now if i just go somewhere i bring to her i can just sit there she just like a, such a wonderful person a teacher can do a lot of things with me so now she's i she's in college now and uh, she's bring her unique unique yeah i mean unique those dance specialty to her friends and then to the college. And I just feel so proud. It's very helpful for uh, to get this uh, uh, friends and then work on with uh, the young uh, fellows and then Kentucky Arts Council. That's just a, we have a former Kentucky Arts Council. I mean, this friends, it's just a wonderful opportunity. I would say thank you. Thank you. It's great to see your um, you and your students um, thriving in the environment here, and um, and also uh, just to point out too, you know, because you, you mentioned this is a type of classical dance, and originally in China where you would see this, um, and in, when you practice it in in the U.S. and in Kentucky and, and or in other states, um, it, you all are um, are practicing it as a cultural group within a within a different within a different mainstream society. So that's often why. Uh, we can we can look at it as a folk and traditional art. You know, you're teaching the art form face to face to other people in your community, and um, it's an expression of your culture, your history, and your um, your li your living traditions as well. Um, so, congratulations for um, for doing great work in the folk and traditional arts here, and, and to you and and Angie and your other students. Thank you. Let's move next to Justin Roberts. And I first met Justin several years ago. He is a willow furniture maker, lives in Western Kentucky, Murray. And um, he and uh, his teacher, whose name is George Beard, 
applied together for an apprenticeship grant so that they could focus in, spend a whole year together. And they actually ended up spending a lot more, more than just a year together. Um, Justin, could you talk about how you first met George and what got what sent you on this path? Yeah, so uh, my name is Justin Roberts with Walk the Willow. And what brought me to George was uh, making my daughter's Easter basket out of willow. And after Easter, we would plant the basket and turn it back into a tree. And the community took notice. The Murray Art Guild, Debbie Danielson, reached out and gave me George's address. And you know, so I went and knocked on George's door. We had a conversation. And it wasn't four months later, my family and I, we had moved in with him and lived with him for four years. Uh, created, besides being a mentor, a, a wonderful friend, he became a grandpa to my oldest daughter. And we still chat with him today. He'll be 92 years young this year and still kicking it. One, a wonderful individual indeed. And y'all nominated him for an award, right? A few years ago, he, he received the uh, Folk Heritage received, Award from, from the yep. Kentucky Governor's Awards in the Arts. In, indeed, he really he, he, he really enjoyed that experience. I mean, you could see that light in his eyes. I think that, that was a, a wonderful thing. For sure. Now, could you talk about how, um, you know, we've, we've, you and I have heard George's story, but I want you to share some of how he uh, developed his style throughout his life. And then, and then maybe as you're, as you're telling his story, talk about some similarities and differences to, to how you, you two work with Willow. So George uh, worked as a m migrant food uh, harvester. He would travel around and harvest food. Uh, he did like a 10,000 mile journey around the States with his family caravan style, uh, living in tents out of the van. And he, he had met uh, it was a, a woman in, ha in Hazel. Her name was Hazel. It was in Arkansas. And she was building willow furniture. It was, you know, very crude. It wasn't real appeasing to look at. And it really intrigued him. And he talked her into teaching him how to build a chair. And of course, George's first chair was nothing to look at, but he kept at it. And, you know, he ended up having dreams on, you know, how he could change things, make it more sturdy, make it more pleasing to the eye. And before you know it, he, it, I mean, he didn't have to travel that 10,000 miles harvesting the food and people just kept buying the furniture from him. And it became a, a career that, you know, I mean, he did it for what, about 56 years. Uh, just, and it was, a, 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 it became a way of life. You know, he never really looked at it as an art form. And it, to, it was just an amazing experience getting to experience his stories, you know, from his journey. You had mentioned that he, he sometimes he would have dreams uh, where he would come up with a design and then make it a reality. And uh, I think that's a great example of how, you know, when, when traditional artists learn a tradition in their community, that they learn, you know, a basis of style and, and art values and techniques, and then they might take it to a, to a different place. Uh, it seems like some people might follow really closely in that tradition and then others might um, take it into different directions. Um, could you talk about how, how well did George uh, um, stick to what he was taught and, and how much did he take it uh, his own way? So, I mean, he really stuck with the foraging aspect of it, you know, like harvesting it from the land, uh, driving around, knocking on people's doors, getting permission to get the willow. Uh, and of course, that also creates a word of mouth of and sharing the, the folk art. And uh, but as in the structure, uh, the integrity of that, he kept that the same. But where he would have visions of, like, say, a butterfly back, instead of it just having a round piece and the back benders being on the back side, he would put them on the front and then create new designs that were comfortable. That's great. So. As, as with any folk tradition, I think that's a great example of how there's always this uh, the sense of continuity, like you're continuing and uh, perpetuating some of the tradition, but you're also changing it in some ways with each new generation that learns it. So I think there's always that balance of continuity and change. And sometimes it leans one way more than the other, but um, 
So that's one of the characteristics of folk and traditional arts as a, as a living um, phenomenon. Now, um, Justin, you've also brought in your own uh, sense of self-expression to the tradition. And could you talk about some of the, some of the ways that you've taken um, the medium of willow and, and other types of wood that you work with um, into your own direction? Well, so when it comes to the furniture, yeah, I've I've dreamt up and you know had ideas of uh, having my style in it with creating like a, a more of a bubble type chair, you know, with just changing the curves up a little bit, uh, playing here and there. And then uh, I was actually asked by the PTO of my daughter's school at uh, Murray Elementary, and they wanted me to build an arch for all the kids to walk under. And, you know, since my daughter was walking under it, it was, became special to me. And then so I came up with this uh, metal interior and in weaving the willow around in a spiral. And that really kind of struck with a lot of folks. <clears throat> and that created more bubbling ideas of, you know, how could I turn that into, and then it got into doing sculptures. And then as I would travel across the Kentucky, to different art and craft shows, uh, I would notice that invasive plants were everywhere. And one thing that I would do in between commissions while learning the furniture from George was I would work for professors and retired professors at Murray State. And my number one job was removing invasive plants from their land. And then so I tried to figure out a way to mesh the two together where I could build large structures uh, out of the invasive plants and then take the willow and weave around those invasive plants to create more of a native plant choking out the invasives. So that's kind of how we've put our spin and I guess it evolved into more of a sculptural style pieces, but yet with willow and then moving into teaching the furniture to try to keep the craft alive because we still forge for the willow. So and look, every other week, today except through this beginning of covid you know we knock on people's doors to get permission to cut the willow and we're able to share the story of george and the kentucky arts council and how it all started we've got a, a comment that's that's a great idea using um using invasive utilizing invasive species and it's a, a great kind of way that, uh, how uh traditional art can overlap with uh you know, your um, ecological um, concerns and ways to, to use the environment and ways to uh, to express yourself, but also to make a, sounds like you're making um, some positive change through your, uh, through your artwork as well. Yeah, from uh, right before COVID hit, uh, the prior year, we eradicated two and a half thousand invasive plants from three different communities in the state of Kentucky, working with about 400 volunteers. Wow. How do, how do you uh, meet or recruit your volunteers? Yeah. Well, so uh, I was an artist in resident at the Bernheim uh, Forest. And you know, so they had volunteers there and, you know, they recruited them from. And then I was also an artist in resident at the Josephine Sculpture Park in Frankfurt. And, you know, we got volunteers through their program. And before those, we built one behind our local library and had basically went around and raised funds my wife and i shannon davis roberts and between 52 businesses we were able to raise about four thousand dollars to help build that piece and educate those businesses about the invasives and then it got put in a paducah paper and then with a link and we had some volunteers just jump on board one person in the chat asks is that justin's arch at bernheim um, could you talk about that and uh, and some of your sculptures that you've like in Frankfurt? I know you've still got the Whippoorwill piece at Josephine Sculpture Park. Where where can people go to see your art right now? Yeah, so the two pieces that are uh, sounds of a Whippoorwill. There is one at Josephine Sculpture Park in Frankfurt, and there is one at the Bernheim Forest. Uh, each one of those is a series of a sculptural bird line. Uh, we basically took invasive plants from the land uh, where they're built uh, to help with the bird habitat to raise awareness about the decline of the whippoorwill bird, the nighthawk. They're at a 75% decline and almost on the endangered list. And 
with, you know, working with the individuals and, you know, we're able to talk about that and bring awareness to it. And then so you can find one, uh, the, the one at the Bernheim is on the back side of Lake Nevin on their Lake Nevin loop. And then the one at Josephine Sculpture Park, it is in their new area that they bought as soon as you pull in their entrance off to the right. Okay. I think you still got a piece in Midway, right? That one of the first arches you built is there, right? Yep, that was the second arch that I built. Uh, so it's at, well, I think it's Walter Bradley Park. That's on the back side of the library as an entranceway into the trail, which I actually got a picture sent to me a couple of days ago where it was, at, I guess made the paper again from a photographer that took a photo of it, which is kind of neat. Super cool, yeah. What about the Kentucky Horse Park? Well, so that commission is still on hold. Uh, I, I got to a point on it and then, and then COVID hit and then just kind of stopped. Uh, we're still under contract with that, uh, but we don't know when that's gonna happen because with every, large installation we do now we also raise awareness about important issues within the community and work with poets and musicians to reach a broader audience and then so it's just it's just kind of on hold uh with, with you know i'm sure everybody covid is devastated but a lot of folks and uh you know just work just kind of stopped. And then so I've been focusing my attention on building blessing boxes for the community. I've made about seven or eight. And then I've been paying extra close attention to a commission that has been put on hold with this fence for some lovely folks that's local. So people can follow you on social media to see pictures of some of your work, but do you have any around that you could maybe hold up to the camera or anything like that? Like that? Uh, I have actually one of George's baskets. So this is a basket that George made. Tell us about it. Uh, what what went into that, and uh, what what's uh, what do we uh, what do we need to know about it as kind of outsiders of of the tradition? Well, so all right. So every single stick is its own separate sapling, except for probably these sides here. So there's probably about maybe a dozen willow saplings. And so every time one's cut, it's going to turn into about four to eight more. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, more, this is a log cabin style. There's no really weaving. Uh, there's a twisted handle that George has put in. From looking at it, he's made it in his later years because when we met, he was still using a uh, hammer and nails. This one looks like he had, you know, he's gotten older and was using uh, a nail gun with this one, but I actually found this at a local thrift store uh, about, I guess it was about a month ago. And of course seeing it, I had had to get it. <laughs> it's a lucky find for you. So you know, I've heard him and, and you both talk about working with Willow and it's renewable, as you mentioned, he said it's easy to grow it and, um, and to harvest it and what, what do you like specifically about working with willow over other types of wood? Well, so for me, uh, what really appealed to me about it is how renewable it is. Uh, I mean, you can literally cut the same plant 26 to 28 years uh, before it has to be replanted. Uh, I mean, other countries use it for electricity. I mean, it dates back to, you know, the you use the bark for aspirin. Uh, you can make charcoal to draw with with it. Uh, I mean, it, it's just so versatile. It's embedded in every religion in some form or fashion. Uh, it grows on every continent. Uh, it, there's about 470 something varieties of willow worldwide. Uh, to me, it's just a, an ex it's really a, a magical plant. Uh, you know, it has the properties to pull heavy metals and toxins out of the ground. So you can and you can use it for erosion control. It's amazing. Sounds like you've uh, you've learned a lot about the, the biology of the plant as well as how to work with it. In, indeed. So whenever we got into building the Willow Furniture, uh, my wife Shannon was going through college uh, while we were living with George and she ended up writing her thesis on Willow and fell in love with the plant. 
Um, we have a question from the chat that is, uh, did you say you replant the Easter baskets and how do you do that? So with willow, it's very resilient. You can literally just take a sapling and walk out and stick it into the ground and it'll grow. Uh, you know, typically you would harvest more, the more and more I learned about it, you would want to harvest it more towards the middle of winter. It lays dormant and then you put it in water to create the root bud starting and then you can just stick it in the ground. But, you know, whenever we first started, I mean, Willow is known for, for instance, George, he always said the key to a beautiful weeping willow is taking your green sapling and then, you know, cutting about a 12 inch piece of it. And when you plant it, plant it upside down and you'll have this gorgeous weeping willow. Amazing. And so when you first harvest it, it looks like you're able to get lots of curves and um, bends out of it. Yep, it's, it's extremely pliable. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, some varieties you can literally almost tie it in a knot without soaking it or steaming it and then you have control over how to how it at least in part how it grows um, uh, your future materials now it also uh, lasts a long time right um i think you all showed me some some wall hangings and and different pieces that were really old yep uh i don't know if i have any out here they're inside but yeah so I mean, it's just really soft wood in the beginning, and when it dries, it's hard, it, it dries hard as a rock. Like, literally, you, you can't drive a nail through it. You know, it'll, it'll bend the nail over uh, when it's dry. Uh, I believe, to like in Holland, the, the wooden shoes, they're made from willow to, you know, give you an idea of, you know, how hard that wood dries. And, um, and so you've uh, you've actually joined. Are you you're a member of the Kentucky Crafted Program, right? Through your friend. Yes. Sir. Yep. What's that been like for you uh, to to take your designs and your your tradition and your and your um, your new designs as well um, to different people and places? That's been an amazing uh, thing. Uh, you know, whenever we applied for it and got it we were able to go through a whole marketing program you know to set the prices and whatnot and it, just from traveling the land and, and meeting the people you know with it all being a, a word of mouth and through, you know through doing the kentucky arts council the market uh getting put on the two shows kentucky life and bluegrass and backroads uh I, this whole journey has just been over the moon for me. You know, I would have never thought in a million years that I could make a living playing with sticks. And, you know, here I am a little over eight years into this journey. It's just been amazing. Have, have sometimes you not, I, sometimes I still pinch myself. <laughs> Wake up, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to see, you know, a growing interest in it. And I wonder if, uh, have you met any, besides maybe, I don't know if your, if your kids or your daughters are interested in learning, but have you met um, people who have wanted to learn uh, things from you so far? I've met a few and right, like, uh, again, with COVID, uh, we were, we had our two first big teaching sessions where I was going to teach about 12 to 14 at a time. And we were going to do one of them at Bernheim and one of them in Asheville, North Carolina. And within a week of launching those two, they were sold out classes. And, you know, so there is a ton of interest in, in learning it. Uh, but it's all, all that, again, is, is, is just on pause. One person says in chat, there's a teacher at Berea, Ron Rosen, who echoes your thinking. Can you elaborate on the idea? Of a, as a weeping willow, um, knowing the artistry of what is unpacked from nature's design. So with, with the weeping willow, I don't use the weeping willow in the furniture. The willow that we use actually never weeps. It's like a river ditch willow. It, it can grow 50 foot tall. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite fascinating. You know, just from going out, uh, it, you literally need barely, hardly any tools, whether it be a set of clippers, a machete, or a handsaw, 
and just collect your different pieces and diameters and, you know, bringing them back and bending them and putting them into place one at a time. Are there any tricks to um, finding those locations where you'll, you'll see uh, the willow growing like that? How do you know, uh, or do you just remember places where you found it before? So I remember where I found it before, but for instance, the last two months, I've cut over 8,000 sticks within Callaway County alone, you know, so now granted at the end of spring, all that's going to quadruple, you know, but I, I'm still working on this fence uh, that I've been building. And so yesterday, the journey led me to Hickman, Kentucky. Uh, so I basically just drive and find a lowland water source. And then start driving back roads from there and you'll eventually see it uh, the winter is kind of the hardest time because the leaves aren't on it but you looking for maroon tops uh it's got the deep reds it almost resembles a like a baby maple trees from a distance uh but I, yesterday i drove the entire levee in hickman i think it's like an 18 mile levee and i ended up over there by the ferry on the Kentucky line and probably found another 3000 willow sticks. And yeah, so I got a truckload now. Are there differences between the way it grows in like Western Kentucky versus central Kentucky or Eastern? Mm, pretty similar. Pretty similar. Uh, I mean, nine times out of 10, the places that I collect the most are just in the ditch or off construction sites where dirt has been moved. Uh, and of course it's real common growing around people's uh, ponds. Okay. Great. So um, we're, we're gonna come back to Justin and Shuling in just a minute, but now I'd like to introduce our other artist, Mitch Barrett, who's joining us from Berea, Kentucky. Mitch, welcome. Thanks, Mark. So great to see you. And uh, thank you for being with us today. And could you talk, Mitch, about, um, tell us about your, yourself as an artist. Um, so Mitch works as a, as a um, performer, but he's also a teaching artist. We had Arts Education Day yesterday and learned about the importance of um, arts in our, um, among our learners in Kentucky. Um, but just, Talk about how you, uh, what led you on this path of, of being a musician. Oh, well, uh, led me on the path of being a musician. Well, I, I grew up with music in my home, traditional music. My grandfather played claw and the banjo, um, music in church, a lot of acapella singing in an old, old regular Baptist church. I live outside of Berea in a little area called Blue Lick. Um, so music was involved in all the family gatherings and both both sides of my family my grandparents were farmers um tobacco farmers and vegetable farmers my on my mother's side my grandparents were uh, they grew tobacco but they also grew these crops to help increase their uh, income so there's huge pepper fields and different things and all of us grandkids would be working there and my grandfather was a storyteller and my grandmother sang and none of these people ever did it professionally but so but music was a part of everything it was part of work it was part of family gatherings and it was all homemade music so that had a big influence on me and then of course in high school i discovered theater and i got interested and thought maybe that's what i wanted to do right out of high school i started doing some theater and then went straight into the the music world but all I had to go on was the traditional music I was raised on. And I had been encouraged by my grandmother to be a writer. So I'd been writing little ditties since I was 12 or 13. And um, so I, I, one period in retrospect, I'm very proud of. At the time I was kind of lost as a young man, but, but I was playing music up and down the East Coast, sometimes seven nights a week in, in these bars and places. But I was mostly playing original music and traditional music. And I'm still proud of that. I was working up and down the East Coast on the beaches and my claim to fame is I never had to sing a Jimmy Buffett song, even though I was working in, in these clubs. But it was because I was around a lot of um, naval, naval bases. And so there was a lot of, a lot of um, young military folks who were from North Carolina, 
Kentucky, Tennessee. So they totally related to the music. And so I found a way of making, making a living with the music I was raised on. Um, but then after 13 years of that and realizing I was not gonna get discovered in a bar, I had to come up with a better way of making a living. And so I came home and I took a job, a real job, as they say, at a cabinet shop. And, and then after a while, a school teacher, an old friend of mine, Carol Combs, who taught up in Hazard, asked if I still did that music thing and asked me to come and visit a school. And, and then I realized there was a possibility of me doing, you know, making a living with my music another way and sharing with my, with my, um, my culture. But the real break was that a teacher from Los Angeles heard me at the Berea Crafts Fair and asked me, he had this dream of bringing five different artists from different cultures into inner city Los Angeles. And I was still working at the cabinet shop at the time. And he was like, I'll get back with you. We don't have funding for this, but he got back with me and I went out there and he said, all I want you to do is talk about growing up in a holler and you can sing, you can tell your stories, but I just want you to be yourself and share your childhood. And they were so interested in my culture, in Appalachian culture, that that, that really was the beginning when I came back and, um, and meeting John Benjamin and a couple of people through the Arts Council. And that, that you know, when I realized, wow, if, if there was ever a need to teach about Appalachian culture, it's in Appalachia. So, um, so that was the beginning of that, just sharing our, our culture and, and the pride I had for it and the pride I was taught by my grandparents. So. Uh, that's, that's amazing. I've, I've not heard that story about your grandmother who, wanted, who encouraged you to be a writer yeah. um, and, and how much um, you know, the uh, music played a part in your everyday life growing up from your church to your family. Um, could you talk more about your, your grandmother and, and how, um, you know, um, her values uh, were shared with you? Uh, did you, did you ever doubt, you know, that you, um, that you would be a writer or um, what, what is it about uh, her, your relationship with her that, that um, led you on that path? Um, well, my granny gay was, um, I think she only went to high school, but her um, her living room was like a library. She had so many books and she was really proud to expose us to Kentucky writers because she knew, this is in hindsight, but she knew that there were so many stereotypes that we were gonna have to deal with. And um, so she really let us know about, you know, these amazing Kentucky writers and people who'd achieved things in, from Kentucky. Her values were, I got a really strong work ethic from both sets of grandparents and, and my parents. And I think um, the writing thing, I, I t um, I've shared with lots of uh, elementary school students and high school students about that period you go through just, and I don't know if it's every culture, but it's definitely Appalachian. But I went through a period, sixth grade or something like that. And almost being ashamed of being from a holler, no TV. And I, mean, I lived with my grandparents and, and they were so backwards, you know. And, you know, and it, it's funny that I would end up making my, my career teaching about how important those values they taught me were. But I do remember that period because the world was stereotyping us. And, and sometimes it was even the stereotype was enforced in schools, you know, like not, not using our dialect and things like that. But um, yeah, just being proud of who we were, having a good, strong work ethic, didn't matter what you did. Somehow they got it across to us that money wasn't the, the, the real goal in life and being, finding some kind of happiness and doing something that you felt good about doing. And I found that through, through the Arts Council, um, working in schools. It took a while, but I really just began to believe in what I was doing. Um, because there was also a pressure in when I wasn't doing traditional music, 
because I don't consider myself a traditional musician, but my music is definitely traditionally based. Now my storytelling is, is traditional, but even in the storytelling, I've always, I've always taken a jack tail, a traditional Appalachian jack tail and been able to, to bring it into the present, you know? So I'm proud of that. I think I got that from my grandmother. I don't know if that answered the question or if I went off. Definitely. No, it, it was great. Uh, I enjoy hearing from you and, and the other two artists as well about how powerful your art is in um, not only um, reaching other audiences outside of your community, you know, people who are, you would consider outsiders uh, of your of what your culture is, um, but also the insiders as well. So the people that you um, that are that you would consider part of your community, in your case, um, other folks that, that live in the Appalachian region. Uh, that grew up on farms like you, and how they um, they connect with your with your art, and, and I think in a lot of cases um, when they when they see you performing, um, that it um, you know it, it's definitely something for them to be proud of, and, and to, it, it's putting uh, the traditions of their community um, you know at their attention as well as the attention of others. So it's celebrating the, the culture of the region. And um, it's it's really powerful when you experience whether whether you're an insider to the to the culture or an outsider. Um, so uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And and now going on with your uh, storytelling, you did an apprenticeship a few years ago as the master artist and teaching uh, uh, Bob Martin. Yes, Robert Martin. Um, could you talk about how you got to know Bob and? What, what you all focus on for your year together? Yes, um, I used to run a, a, a music festival called the, the Clear Creek Healing Arts and Music Festival, which came out of touring all the time and just thinking, you know, I don't want to be on the road all the time raising my kids. And so anyway, I did that. And then later on, uh, life evolved and, and we ended up selling the property and Bob and his wife bought it. And Bob was a very experienced, educated actor. He went to school for acting. And so I, I, I was kind of envious of that, but he was also interested in storytelling and he loved the fact that I grew up in a tradition that I learned my storytelling, it was handed down to me. And uh, so, you know, the idea of do it, me being the master artist kind of blew me away, but I learned so much of, um, about what I knew and about what he knew as we went through this apprenticeship and, and we got to do um, performance at the end of that, that. And we're still, we still collaborate on things. But, uh, and we did a little theater company after that together. So, uh, which wasn't your traditional theater company. It was, we were gathering stories from the community, real stories and writing plays. So it was still storytelling based. And uh, I think we learned a lot from each other that way. Awesome. It's, it's great to hear, you know, how that master and a, or teacher apprentice relationship um, really affected both of you. So it's the apprentice is learning a lot during their time with you, but, but then also it seems like the, a, a thing develops there during your time together and sort of being able to focus on the traditional art form and not just the techniques of it, but, but the stories and the culture behind it, you know, just spending that time together is, uh, seems like it's really valuable to y'all. And oftentimes we hear about the mentor getting getting a lot out of the experience as well. Um, yeah, the, like the whole uh, um, experience of storytelling is is just such a learning thing. You know, telling your story, you learn so much about yourself. But to have somebody actually honoring your your story, and you examine that as you as you share it, it yeah, it's a wonderful experience. Great. And so through your art, you've brought different people together and, and sort of broken down barriers and uh, helped people understand one another. And I think I think Robert has done that a lot, too. So um, and we're, what's what's Bob been into lately? I haven't talked to him in a while. Is, is he still uh, doing this work? Yeah, he's uh, still, as a community? He's still uh, creating these character shows like he had a, a play recently last year or so that he he did a, a character called Ezekiel. And it was it was an environmentally based but it was Appalachian based, um, this character. And you just watch this character evolve and, and the play was actually done in the woods and people had to walk out to the, to the performance site. 
you know, you were talking about the, you know, affecting other people. That was one thing I, I forgot to mention about, about my grandmother. To me, her just encouraging me to write um, was very uh, therapeutic and healing. I don't know if she knew that. But I mean, I do know she knew that because she said, if you keep these things inside you, they'll, they'll fester and make you sick, you know? And of course we all know that now they call it stress and stuff like that. But, but that became a part of my art and realizing how healing storytelling can be and, or just being creative in general, whether you're making a basket or, or learning a dance or it's just so healing. And um, I'm so proud to, to be a part of that and, and for that to be a, a real driving force in, in my, my art form is, you know, as I tell the kids, I don't write a lot of ooh baby, ooh baby songs. My songs are usually about something, you know, something I'm dealing with or questioning or wondering about. And, and your music still continues to play an important role in your family. Could you talk about um, teaching your kids how to play music and, and what that means to them now? Yeah, um, my daughter Zoe started fiddle lessons when she was three. And to this day, she plays in Zoe Speaks now. She plays in the band. And uh, her husband, Arlo Barnett, he plays in the band too. And Arlo, it's interesting, he grew up the same way as Zoe. He was homeschooled and music, traditional music was a big part of his life. So it's really beautiful to see them together. Zoe is, has not went crazy for the be in front of an audience kind of thing. You know, she has another job, she has another career, but still plays as much as she always did. Now, my youngest daughter, Maisie, is just an amazing writer and, and artist, you know, and uh, that's, that's always been, I guess, just exposure to it. I don't know, because we never pushed it on them. It's, it's always been something they wanted to do. And um, so I'm really proud of both of them. They're, they're fine artist in their on their own behalf and, and we're here in uh in the background uh the newest member of the, of the barrett family right learning to yeah, learning yeah. Some licks. that's my my new baby alder and he's he's going to be a singer i think sounds like he already is <laughs> i think so <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that, Mitch. Now let's let's loop back around. If we could go back to Shu Ling, and uh, and just follow up with some of, some of these uh, ideas that we're hearing. Um, and it's great to see such a variety of uh, cultural and traditional arts being practiced in Kentucky. Um, you know, we are a, a diverse state. We've made up. We're made up of a lot of different um, cultures and communities. And um, and this year has given us. Uh, in some cases, many challenges, and in some cases, opportunities to um, to think about what our art means to us. And um, Shuling, uh, anything that you've heard from the other two artists uh, that you, that has uh, been important to you, or that that you connected with, uh, if you want to talk about that, or or what what how the last year has been different for you as a as a traditional dancer. Yes, um, that's true. Uh, but from both Justin and the Mitchell, there are ideas. One of the, the processes they were doing is lots of uh, experience and knowledge to me. And uh, I don't know much about those uh, baskets, but I love it. I always buy it. I definitely, next time I go, I search your product, Justin. That's beautiful. And then Mitchell. You know, Justin, you made a sale. <laughs> yes. And then, see, I always go to Kentucky Arts Council, the market every year. Uh, well, I just don't know how, I don't have anybody like a connected with now. I know who I'm going to. So that's great. So Mitchell, so whatever he talked about, I feel lots of um, some feeling. Um, like uh, when you get into teach, sometimes it's not about the money, it's that uh, passion. So you do whatever you need to do. Sometimes not just like my genre, it's not just like a beauty show, the culture. Um, sometimes I feel that's a, a well, I, let me put this one like a calling. It's like a mission. It's calling me. I needed to do, promote this culture, like I try to teach people. And then that's urgent for me to, to see. So even I'm not in China, but in here, we have so many 
uh, heritage here, and there is a Chinese American here, we needed to let them still pass those, their, I mean, appreciate their root. So that's what I'm doing. And then I feel that's no matter what, I love it. I would like to dance this all the time and uh, um, just do whatever they want, um, just like uh, pass those beautiful culture to them and then remember those history. So for this COVID year, <laughs> it's a hard, our last performance, what I mean, actual uh, theater performance was on March 7th, last uh, 2020, that's for a celebration of uh, International Women's Day at the Lyric here. Um, we just enjoyed that. We treasured that ever since we had lots of lineup, the performance, very busy schedule, all canceled. So we just feel, unfortunately, and then for the safety distance uh, issue, I had to close the uh, studio and because of, uh, I don't want the people getting worried about their kids getting infected or anything. Um, to me, um, I work in the, uh, not the hospital, but you can health care, but I have to go to work every day. And to me, like uh, we practice all those uh, safety issues, uh, uh, those uh, uh, careful, we just we'll be very careful. Uh, we. Well, what do I saw just like so many people getting sick, you never know what's going on. So we just in doing that. I taught the uh, online class for a while, and I'm just I'm not. I'm, I know a lot of people do it. I'm not just not well good to do online movement, and I had to <laughs> watch every student. I don't see anybody like a lot of people to do it. They just show their head for those little kids. So it's hard, so I just completely just close the, my program. Until recently, I see the future, it's probably everything coming back. And I already, because I work in the healthcare and I already get my vaccine shot, I have my antibody, like a COVID antibody produced. I'm a, I'm a lucky one. So I feel I'm relatively safe. So I that's my goal to going back soon. And then meanwhile, for the Zoom, I had a Zoom one just uh, two days ago on Sunday night with uh, the UN National Chinese Community Collaborate Collaboration and then eight of uh, still dance studio across the United States. We did that, that together, and then we had a uh, also same state not a stage performance, just a Zoom performance with the Chinese Dance Academy, Beijing Dance Academy they're top uh, professionals. And then like a Liaoning province uh, ballet, professional ballet um, performance. So we're very happy to not only, I just like uh, I was said earlier, we're, don't, we're not going to only to do this uh, folk dance promoted in Kentucky, we just try to connect to all our folk group and the national wild now. So at least the, that's what the benefit that I got. <laughs> We got from those. Uh, so for the Zoom, we I didn't know that. Now it's pretty good. So we for the Zoom performance. So we just submit our video and whatever from the past, and then put those together, and then it's pretty good. So I keep that uh, optimistic. That's great to hear. And. Uh... We have a question from uh, that came from our chat. Can you talk a little bit about how art forms? This is for both of us. Um, how art forms that not that did not originate in the United States become part of Kentucky culture when they are practiced and taught here, and how does that enhance Kentucky's artistic culture? What did um, you have to say about that? You, you probably know those more than me, but to myself, because uh, this. Um, you, in the United States, we have like about like 1% of a population now is Asia, Chinese Asia. So we have to, we, we just uh, all the, uh, like the first generation, second generation down the road, we all just pre appreciate our culture. And then since it's not the uh, majority or popular one, it's a very minority here. And so this art form, it becomes, all community people's like a very important part. And then to pass this culture to down to our, uh, our younger generation, that performing arts 
this like Ch a dance, a Chinese dance is much easier and the quickest way to uh, let the people see, oh, what's the Chinese culture be like? So those one, China has a 56 ethnic group. It just you like, like the United States, we have so many. And then each of that, each of the ethnic group has its own um, art form and then the culture. And so we try to uh, promote this folk dance and each day a group is a folk dance and to uh, well, teach, I mean, try to teach those one to my students. And then so they will fully understand how people get in together, even in China, how we do that. And then in here, we have tried to use the arts form to represent our, uh, for the big like a view for the uh, daily life, we how to people getting together, be living a very harmony uh, life. And then so do not just create a more diversity culture. So I think that's important. And this kind of a new thing, yes, this is not the Kentucky folk dance, but it is because the population growing. So that's so important for us. And then even like a big city, like New York, and then they celebrate the Chinese New Year, that's a day off, the like vacation day. <laughs> so I wish we have that here too, but they take times. That's, that's a great point and, and good question and a good time to, to bring up the idea that, you know, um, everybody, when they move, they take their culture with them. They take, you know, what's important to them with yes. them. And, uh, and Kentucky's always been that way, really. I mean, unless you're a, a Native American person, then um, we've some our our groups have moved to Kentucky. Um, some of us by choice, and some of us not. Um, but um, the idea that you know when you when you bring what's most important with you and and keep that going, you know, within your families and communities, that you know it's always going to interact with with your neighbors and and those around you, and and new things are going to develop um, all the time. So I'm, I'm glad for that question and, uh, and uh, great, great insights there to point out. Um, uh, Shuin, could you talk about, um, you know, with your time with Angie, especially um, during your apprenticeship, mm -hmm. you all uh, focused a lot on uh, specific dances and, and traditions that you, you've been learning your whole life. Um, what about the, um, um, were there things besides just the dance lessons, like the movements and how to, how to wear the costumes and how to use the props? Um, what were some other things you think that that Angie got out of that experience um, and spending time with you? Did you all uh, did you all spend a lot of time talking to one another and um, you know asking questions about uh, what's important to you as traditional artists? Oh yes. Um, but first of all, when I uh, just if, if it's not even only to Angie and to all my students, when I start to create a dance, and I always give them background, so everything for the just the movement and the hands movement and then prop, uh, uh, prop, uh, props. We also talk about this dance movement, how it relates to the dance, what the tradition they have, what the religion they have. So, so that way they can learn more, expose more the culture, the history of China. And to Angie, so that's what she learned more. And then I give her a lot of information. And then she she's very smart. She's she learned, uh, she just learned that one. And then so she used my way. We're not just dancing, we are talking about the culture. So use the dance as the platform. And then we actually we are doing the culture, uh, just like educating for education for the culture. So that's what we will mainly actually focus on, like a Mongolian dance. People live in that um, um, grassland, and then there there are like a like a nomads people. They live and keep moving back then. If it's not now, back then. So they're they're living there. They're mainly their daily life related to the horse, and just like Kentucky. And so once we we'll movement, we we'll never. I found that's easy for kids to remember that the movement that related to a coach, like a horse, like a horse movement, movement that you sit on the horse. So your body will shake a little bit, just doing this one and two and the three and the four, keep doing. That's what you're doing in horse. And then you go over there, come back, go over, come back. So students, they by this way, they connect to what the people are doing over there. And then what they are related to, like a communication tool is, so that that's how they get into this culture quickly. 
that's what I'm projected to how I do it. So uh, what the engine, um, she did, yeah, she did more than other one because she has the time, she has the opportunity to do this one. We, she did the, those like those bowl dance, it's very hard. People will use those bowl and then to eat it, but she put it on the head to like to do the dance and the, and the turning. That's the culture doing. They're just like people celebrating their festival, they're doing that. And so for the fan, like a fan dance and the dragon dance related to the Chinese New Year, um, or any like a festival, and then just bring out your precious, like a uh, joy, uh, join out. So it's a lot, I think, to quickly, um, when they study all those ones, like their world history, study or social study, they're just quickly related to whatever they, were, they did from the dance. That's what all my students told me. So I'm feel very, very happy for that. Did I answer your question? Yes, wonderfully. That's a, that was a great example of how um, the the symbol or the uh, the movements of the horse and the horse as an important cultural tradition um, in Mongolia, mm -hmm. and how you you use you think you have your students think about horseback riding and the movement of you know being on a horse as informing the way that they dance. Um, I think that's a great that's a great example of you know the learning that the depth of learning that goes into um, what you teach and then how it's connected with um, the place the places and people that it came from. And um, thank you. Um, let's see. And you had talked about this too, as a um, like Mitch said, um, his grandmother had warned him that if he if he bottled this up or if he kept these things inside of him that. Uh, that it, it, he wouldn't feel right, he wouldn't feel well, like that he has to express his culture. Um, did, did that mean anything to you? Or does that, do you, could you identify with that, that if you if you weren't teaching dance, would you feel different? Uh, do you feel like you said it was kind of an urgent, there was an urgent need to, um, to practice the art form and to teach the art form, or that you were called to do it? Um, I think, uh, I think the urgent to uh, pass this uh, tradition and then to more People like uh, those uh, heritage, uh, um, uh, Chinese American or those uh, non Chinese uh, Chinese her uh, heritage. Um, what uh, sometimes what uh, uh, caused me, I think uh, the more we did, um, it's it, it just like a, I think the arts is the only thing I can do. I mean, if without the arts, and then a lot of people advocate those uh, their uh, voice uh, talk about the diversity. Sometimes I think like uh, I'm just powerless with those one. I mean, for art is more powerful to me as so immediately get the people so let them appreciate this culture. And then in the past year, and because of COVID nineteen, and lots of Chinese get attack attacked here and verbally, physically, and I just feel, I don't know what to do. And by just, uh, I kind of I feel like it's a very pale, he's talking, talking. So I'm trying to use some more, I mean, for the arts to me, it's a more powerful tool for me. I just try to bring out the people, how we live together, how we love each other. And it's just my part. I think that's all I can do and I can do, I, th I think it works. Um, I guess that's what my answer is. Thank you, Shaleen, for sharing that. And that's, I, th I think you're right. It is, it is one of the um, most powerful tools that you have that you can share um, to help to help different groups understand one another. Um, let's let's go to Justin now and see uh, check back in with him on, you know, what we've heard from the other artists. Justin, is there anything that uh, that has clicked with you and and hearing from Shuling and Mitch? That, uh, that you can relate to. Uh, one thing that I was thinking about was how you first got started in this art form was by making a, a basket for your daughter. And that, that this art form is really important to you and your, and your family now. Um, could you talk about that? Well, first off, the, I really enjoy both of the other artists and, and their stories and, and how it meshes, uh, you know, it really is a thread, you know, it takes a village for Kentucky. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, 
What were you wanting me to talk about again? Keep going on that thread. That was great. Um, talk about how, um, you know, learning from George, uh, how your art form is rooted in, uh, in, his, in his experience and, and then how, it all, how it's also taken root in your experience um, now as a, as a dad and a, and a uh, resident of Murray. Well, yeah, with, with me, you know, I mean, it was, I guess I should go back to the beginning. You know, I was aspiring chef uh, and, and I was depressed trying to make a living as a cook in a rural community, you know, where people really didn't value food that much. You know, it was more of, uh, and I, I, I was tired of the throwaway culture and I had caught a documentary it's also a book by Michael Pollan called The Botany of Desire. And you know, it's basically about the human relationships between plants and animals. And whenever I watched that film, something in me sparked. You know, I, I was I just I really wanted to become as close to nature as I could and live in harmony with with earth and you know, just try to do my best at lowering my emission footprint and my family's footprint. And, you know, so my story is, it, it's all about serendipity. You know, I was going a different route and, you know, it, this just kind of happened and a window opened and I jumped through the window, so to speak. And, you know, with, with teaching myself how to make a basket from pictures and weaving that with Zoe at our small cottage, home at the time bringing all these willow saplings in and just you know that aroma took over the house making that and you know creating those memories with my daughter zoe and you know going out to a nearby woods woodline and you know putting that basket back into the ground and then you know as years go on through the murray art guild doing teaching other children you know how to make their basket and you know we would build the basket and then put it in a pot where it would their basket would literally grow in front of their eyes to me that's quite magical and so you're seeing the next generation kind of take interests now is that right yeah. indeed um, indeed uh, for like I, I did the uh, idea festival uh, a year or two ago and, you know, so I had been making these counter pose tables where basically I just go to a nearby construction site and gather their leftover materials or pallets that are laying around town. And I had come across some, you know, old gym weights that nobody wanted. And I had put these gym weights and then built a casing with pallets and then took willow saplings and wove them around to make it look like a counter pose floating shelf. And then so I took the beginnings of this to the Idea Festival in Bowling Green. And I think it was like I gave each kid a stick and each kid wove in their own stick to this table. And I think it collectively it was probably around 300 or so kids that each put a stick into that table. And, you know, now I have that table in my front yard as kind of like a yard ornament, so to speak to hold some flowers and you know to every time i look at that i think of you know each kid that wove in that stick you know so it became a collective piece from kids all across the state of kentucky and you know just seeing them and their lives light up as you know we're talking about willow and you know how renewable it is and you know just the importance of you know living in harmony with nature and and living with it instead of fighting it But yeah, it is a really powerful, uh, it sounds like a really powerful group expression that, uh, you know, that the the way you get people to work together on a common goal uh, and then have something to be proud of at the end of it. Um, what have you learned over the last year about, um, you know, how you've had to do things differently um, and how do you think that's going to inform um, your art in the future uh, once, mm. things, once things get better after the pandemic? I know that there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, about that. Uh, I, I don't know. I've been, like I said, focusing my attention on building blessing boxes. A really close friend of ours started a Callaway County collective page, you know, where it was just getting people the essential needs 
that they need to survive. Uh, and that grew, and you know, with my building skills, you know, I was asked to build a blessing box, and you know, I just kind of ran with that and kept building them. And you know, uh, we've been slowly working on a nonprofit called the New South Arts Initiative to grow biocultural diversity and you know, just trying to figure out a way to build more pieces in nature. Uh, that people can enjoy from afar instead of inside a closed building at the moment, considering that we can't gather. And now that you're, uh, you, you've got, you've had a lot of experience as a chef before you were a, um, a furniture maker. Were there any uh, uh, like lessons or values that you had as a chef that you think carried over into this? Um, because I think, you know, food and, and we're gonna talk about food later in farming, but um, I think the food culture um, plays into, might play a role in, in how you, uh, you approached uh, furniture making. Uh, I, 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 would, I would see like a, an attention to detail, uh, so to speak, they, they cross over. Uh, one thing that I've learned a lot with the willow is, uh, you know, like problem solving skills because I rely on the land, you know, so I, if I get an order for furniture, Sometimes I don't know where the willow is coming from, but, you know, I believe in the journey, you know, so it's all about problem solving and being patient uh, with meshing those together. Have your kids expressed any interest in uh, being furniture makers or, or willow artists? A little bit. Uh, I haven't really pushed it. Uh, in the beginning, Zoe, you know, would make stars and baskets and trains or uh, stuff for like teachers week and she would give to her teachers and whatnot. Uh, she's more into music at, at the moment. And, you know, so anything that our kids are into, we try to foster that, you know, so we I don't want to push it on them by no means. Uh, every once in a while, you know, she'll help me in the willow patch, collecting willow, stuff of that nature. But at the moment, she's into drumming and taking drum lessons. Yeah, so she's getting into the music side of things. Great. Uh, Murray seems to be a, a thriving place for, for arts, both, uh, you know, traditional and otherwise. Um, what do you think that's, uh, um, do you see that uh, momentum going into the future? Is How is Murray doing these days with with uh, supporting its artists and traditional artists the murray art guild is a wonderful organization you know that har that harnesses its local talent and with murray state university and the art department uh i've come to know since stepping into the art world uh, a plethora and you know how a lot of talented folks live and you know have come here to teach at murray state you know with so I, I've gained a lot of mentors over the years that have fostered me and mentored me in, in this path. And, you know, to me, it's about, to me, the, the truest art is the art of listening and, you know, following through with, with that. That's great. I, I used that the other day. I think I stole it from you, actually, the art, <laughs> the art of listening. Um, well, uh, so I, I actually have to give credit to that to Ron Whitehead, the Kentucky outlaw poet, is where I got that piece from, The Art of Listening. Tell me about it. Why is, it, why is listening an art? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for, for listening. You know, granted, I, I was lucky enough to have George in my hometown. You know, uh, and then, you know, remembering seeing his furniture as as a kid. But I don't know, to just the art of listening. Like, so, for instance, this to put it into perspective how far we've come. Whenever I first got into this and we were living with George and learning the furniture, I set up at my first show through the Murray Art Guild at the holiday sale. And the director of uh, NPR uh at our local radio station wkms came up to me and she goes you're you're living a grant and at that moment in time i didn't know what a grant was i had never heard the term and then you know so i mentioned it to shannon and you know she wrote the grant that we received through the kentucky arts council and from there you know to 
it really became the art of listening. The more I look back on it, you know, of, you know, somebody says you should do this, you know, you should take your furniture to Berea, you should join the Kentucky Guild, you know, you should do the Kentucky Crafted. And, you know, so it was just following that has just been a, a magical experience, trusting and believing in the journey. Well said. Thank you so much, Justin, for sharing that uh, that story and Shu Ling as well. And we're going to move over now to Mitch Barrett to kind of shine the spotlight on Mitch um, to follow up on any any thoughts that he's had. I think from all these artists that we're talking with today, we're hearing how um, uh, support for the arts can make really big differences in people's lives. Um, not only you all who are the um, the apprenticeship grant recipients, but but also among your apprentices and your families and your communities, you know, there's really a, for this one year project that, that is supported by the Arts Council, there's really a lifetime of returns for you and, and everybody involved. So um, thanks for um, helping us tell that story today. And uh, Mitch, do you have any thoughts on what we've heard from um, Justin and Chu Ling? Just, I'm seeing that thread, like Justin said, there's, there's a thread between all of this and it doesn't matter the, the art form you know that that is there even uh, the art of listening you know that's one of the things i've shared a thousand times with uh, kids in schools with my grandmother saying to me people to learn how to listen sounds like it's easy but and here's the storytelling when you're listening to somebody and they start talking about their dog two minutes into it or three seconds into it you're not listening anymore you're thinking about your dog so you're off on your own story. And my granny used to say, if you don't learn to listen, you'll never learn anything. And so, and I would also use that in, in schools when the, the kids were getting a little out of hand and I had to bring them back. I was like, okay, let's go back to what I was talking about. If we don't learn to listen, we can't learn anything. But yeah, just this common thread of all these artists and, and uh, just how, well, you know, the, the grants and the, I've overlooked it many times, Justin, myself, of not knowing about grants and stuff. And, you know, Carla Gover, the mother of two of my children, Carla was very good at finding grants. And I've watched her go through a couple of apprentices. And, you know, we just lost Lee Sexton. And I watched her apprentice banjo with Lee. And, and he, you know, would have never thought of himself as a teacher. And it was just amazing to watch and, and, and I also had, you know, I learned some techniques that maybe that person that you're apprenticing is a, not a teacher. So we, we discovered that if we used video, she, it was easier for her to go back and get what he was actually teaching because he was just sharing time and playing the banjo with her, you know. Anyway, I don't know if I'm... Great point. Uh, I'd encourage uh, anybody in the audience to go look up uh, Lee Sexton, the banjo player. Um, from from Eastern Kentucky and and the real he's a real Kentucky treasure that we've lost recently, um, but at least we have uh, some consolation in knowing that he's touched many lives um, among musicians and, and others in the region and beyond, um, and and part of that is uh, like with Carla Gover getting to to be his apprentice and and then sharing what she's learned from from Lee and others to her apprentices. Um, that's that's part of the. Uh, the dynamic that, that we're seeing here and that that um, what what how the values of um, that emerge here in Kentucky are passed on from generation to generation. Um, so great point. And um, Mitch, if you're ready to, to tell us some stories or sing us some songs, we sure love to hear them. All right. Um, I won't go into it, but I just um, had a pretty serious head surgery. So I haven't really sang. I try a little bit each day. I had kind of a mini stroke and was scared that I wasn't gonna be able to play the guitar or sing or do anything. But I'm, I'm recovering and I'm feeling good. So um, this is gonna be experimental. I don't know okay. if I can even do it, but I'm gonna try. Um, Thank you so much. And, and we don't wanna pressure you. If you feel like you need to take a break, please just let me know or pause anytime you like. Uh, Lord, what a year, COVID and I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm ready to, to be working with kids and performing and, you know, but I can't rush it. But anyway, I was, uh, I was talking some about, 
Um, I don't do traditional music, but my music was basic, was definitely traditionally based. And occasionally I'll write something that is way away from traditional. And then other times I'll write something that is just straight out of church or something. You know, I'm just like a, I'm channeling my grandparents. And, and I think about that sometimes the, the storytelling, all of that came around work, you know, like I mentioned, they were tobacco farmers and in the tobacco field, there were songs and stories. And my favorite was the stripping room because they were, they were, that's where you had the old people, young people, male and female, all in the same room, trapped, doing a job that basically a monkey could do if you give him enough bananas. But you're, you're there, you're gonna be there all day. And it just made for the you know, big wood stove going and just lots of stories and songs and, and sometimes patches of silence and stuff. Anyway, I think, I think that's where I got my whole love of music and storytelling. As my granny would say, sometimes it's not the music you hear, it's the spaces in between the music that makes the music. My granny was a very wise woman. Anyway, I'll try, I'll try to do this one. This one came out of uh, standing and doing dishes, staring out the window down the holler. My mother lives down the holler and sometimes I'll just look down there and see her house and the light on late at night and stuff. But I think this came sometime after my father had passed. <coughs> Try to show. Who will sing rock of ages? Who will shout hallelujah? Who will praise God Almighty when we lay the old folks in the ground? Who will sing precious memories? Who will shout Glory, glory, who give thanks for all our blessings when we lay the old folks in the ground. Who will teach the little children? Who will help us with our burdens? Who will keep the home fires burning when we lay the old folks in the ground? Who will tell the old time stories? Who will speak of things forgotten? Tell me who will remember when we lay the old folks in the ground. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, let us gather around our elders. Let us call upon the wisdom while they still walk among us in this world. Let us love them while they're living. Let us repay all they've given so our hearts will not be burdened when we lay the old folks in the ground. <clears throat> so that you can definitely hear um, old time acapella church singing. And then to hear the This, sometimes the storytelling and the music come together for me. And uh, I, mean, I always hope there's a story in my songs. But I don't know how many you want me to play more. This one came out of, I was doing a residency in Pikeville with uh, teenage mothers. There was probably... 14 or 15 teenage mothers there. And uh, we were gonna write a song together. It's called, my, my little program I came up with is called Story to Song. So we share our stories, you know, how did you end up in this position? And what's, what's the hard part of this position? And of course, in that, in that sharing, they would discover that, that they weren't alone, that they had all these things in common with these other people. And, um, so anyway, that, that's where this song came from. And, and we were, we wrote some verses using, uh, sometimes I'll use prompts and, and one of them was, um, we didn't have to come up with the people's name. I used a couple of people's name. Uh, I used Pretty Polly a lot. That was a song my, my grandpa used to sing a lot. So I'll stick Pretty Polly in a modern song. But um, we came up with these verses and then the girls were like, they wanted to give up on the song. They were like, it's just too sad. It's just 
too sad. And I, I said, here's my storytelling skills coming in. I started talking as if I knew what I was talking about. I said, that's the trick. Now we write a course and the course is magic. And, and the course brings it all together. And, and then I said, you know, I was at a doctor's office and I picked up a mag magazine and, and I read that if you read to yourself, it goes to one part of your brain. But if you read out loud and your brain hears you saying these words, it goes to another part of your brain. I don't know if I actually, if that actually happened or if I just made that up in the storytelling moment, but they bought it and we came up with a course. So anyway, this is the song. <laughs> Pretty Polly felt so all alone. She sang herself a sad song. She had no husband or no family. So she hang herself in her pity tree. My grandmother used to say that when we were feeling sorry for herself. And then the chorus, you're not so alone. You're not really that different. Everybody needs someone to hold their heart, their pain, their forgiveness. She filled herself with lots of things, but inside she felt so empty. She had booze and pills and sweets and dreams. Every night she cried herself to sleep. But the trick is if you sing this out loud, you should receive the healing. So sing it out loud so you, so you can receive this. Here we go. You're not so alone. You're not really that different. Everybody needs someone to hold their heart, their pain, their forgiveness. Over on the other side of town, in a window, no curtains, said a lonely boy, nay, a clown, he could not hide his hurt. Just a man. <coughs> You're not so alone. You're not really that different. Everybody needs someone to hold their heart their pain their forgiveness the place he lived he paid no rent the building was abandoned just like him and the way she felt that night she left him standing it's the last chorus sing it good and loud so your brain can hear you singing it and saying these words to you it's like church you're not so alone. You're not really that different. Everybody needs someone to hold their heart, their pain, their forgiveness. Oh, I forgot to tell you, if you look somebody else right in the eye and sing this with all your heart, you get like a double whammy healing. So here we go. You're not so alone. You're not really that different. Everybody needs someone to hold their heart, their pain, their forgiveness. Everybody needs someone to hold. Your heart, your pain, your forgiveness. Thank you so much. Beautiful, Mitch. So, I don't know, Mark, you, you, you want another song or you? Can you go? Do you have enough for maybe five or ten more minutes? We could do another song or or story, whatever you feel like. I can do another. Uh, let's see. What if, 
feels good to sing and it's scary to sing. I was afraid I'm, I'm not, obviously I'm not in good voice, but I will be. I ain't dead yet, as they say in Monty Python. <coughs> you can come down with it. Um, I grew up in a old regular Baptist church. I mentioned that. Uh, there wasn't much to do out here as a kid, except go to church or skate rink. Or as I tell the kids, there was nothing to do. Play in the woods, play in the creek, go down, ride a pony, play in the apple orchard. There was nothing to do around here. <laughs> but uh, but we did go to church a lot. Uh, my mama did. She, she went, it was kind of a social activity. And, uh, but the church we went to is a little one room church with this uh, big old wood stove just blazing. And the preacher, I don't know if you've ever been to old regular Baptist church, but I can give you a visual. He had really greasy hair and beady eyes and he'd scream, you burn in hell. And we, I was, you know, I was like, I'm only five. I ain't done anything yet. But anyway, um, he'd scream at us and the stove would be blazing and it was so hot. And it was that fire and brimstone kind of preaching. And I just remember as a kid, you know, we didn't ha have TV when I was that age, but, but it was Disney. It was like Fantasia or something. You know, the stove was the devil. He was his right hand man or something. I, it was just crazy. But my mama would let me lean over and put my, my head against the window pane, you know, to stay cool because it was so freaking hot in there. But I was actually listening to this other church, which was 25, maybe 50 yards away from this church. And it was a different de denomination. At my church, it was a sin to play an instrument. You could sing, but you couldn't play an instrument. Now at this other church, they rocked out. They had Les Pauls and uh, tambourines and drums and you'd see kids bouncing by the window. You know, it was, it, it was just, I would sit, look over there and see them having some kind of joyous fun. And then I'd look back and see the demon fire stove and the preacher spitting and screaming. And <laughs> finally I, got, I come to a certain age and I said, mama, I think God wants me to look into other denominations. And she's pretty open-minded. So she let me start going to that church because they were so close. She'd drive to her church and I'd walk over there. And, uh, and it was really nice, had a big, the music had a real influence on my life because they were singing praise songs and kids were playing and there was happiness. It was, it was a nice break from the other church. But then one night they broke out snakes. I don't like snakes. And I went back to my mama and I said, mama, I think God wants me to look into other denominations. Well, to make a long story even longer, um, it was 1968 or something like that. And uh, there was a Catholic priest, Catholic priest named uh, Ralph Biting, Ralph Biting from uh, Berea. And Ralph, he was sent by the Catholic Church to go into Eastern Kentucky and see if there was enough interest for a parish. And he came back and told him that he didn't think there was, but there was a real need for help. And somehow the church didn't fund it, so he broke off and started the Christian Appalachian Project which I still to this day do, pro, do work for. Um, but they would come out into the hollers and, and get us poor Appalachian kids and, and take us to camp in the big city of Berea. And they had Kool-Aid and cookies. And, you know, me and my cousin Earl were like, yeah, we'll sign up. We'll drink your Kool-Aid, so to speak. And we, so we went to that. And the only thing was you had to go to mass. So this was my next religious experience. And so we'd go to mass and they'd, light some candles and incense and they'd get up, sit down, wouldn't no screaming, wouldn't no snakes. It's a pretty cool experience. But my family being a uh, part Native American, my grandmother never completely trusted the Catholic church, even though this wasn't Catholic, it was Father Biting in the Christian Appalachian Project. But um, anyway, to make a long story longer, over the years I've looked into all kinds of religions and and as I got older, I started just bringing home souvenirs. Anywhere I would travel, I'd 
you know. So I'd put these things in my yard. So I'd have all these different religious icons hanging from trees and up on rocks and totem poles from the Native American stuff, and just all this stuff. So anyway, jump ahead a few years. I'm a grown man, got two children uh, here at the house with me. And uh, I'm here by myself one day. And it was a Sunday afternoon or something. And, and I thought, all right, today I'm going to write a song. So I got up and I lit some incense and uh, got that song out or ambiance thing happened, poured me some coffee. And about that time, this strange car pulled up in the driveway. And it was these two young guys with ties on. And they come walking up and they're like, hi, can we talk to you about the Lord? You know, I was like, why, sure, come on in. And about 10 minutes into it, they're like, well, brother, we better get going. You know, I think I scared them. But anyway, they're like, well, thank you. you know, and I was like, okay, you know, <clears throat> come back and see me anytime. But as they were leaving, they were walking down through all this stuff in my yard. And I was, I just couldn't help but thinking if I'd been them and pulled up and seen this stuff, I'd have went, nah, let's go to the next house. But I'm glad it happened because as they were leaving, sure enough, a song came to me. And this is that song. <clears throat> I'm still working on that introduction. Outside my front yard, I've got a plastic rooster and a Noah's Ark. Camel bells from a foreign land. Crystal ball on a terracotta stand. Jesus cross is hanging in the trees. Tibetan prayer flags blowing in the breeze. Rub my lucky yard, no as you walk past. My concrete Buddha laughing in the grass. Wipe your feet before you step from your car. You're on hallowed ground. You're in my sacred yard. Holy water in the bird, about to wash your sins. Now you're forgiven. Come on in. If you're searching for happiness, try not to look so hard. Oh, yeah, that's the third verse. I got a silver star, David, stained glass moon, sentimental objects hanging in my room. Everything is sacred, every breath of air. Careful what you're thinking, every thought's a prayer. It's the ordinary people you talk to every day, incantations and prophecies from the mouths of babes. You can talk about the weather or the food you crave. It's the feelings you project, not the words you say. Wipe your feet before you step from your car. You're on hallowed ground. You're in my sacred yard. Holy water in the bird, about to wash your sins. Now you're forgiven. If you're searching for happiness, try not to look so hard. Take you a lawn chair, go out in your yard and stare straight up at the sky so deep. Yeah, God's in heaven, but heaven's in you. Wipe your feet before you step from your car. You're on hallowed ground. You're in my sacred yard. Holy water in the bird, about to wash your sins. Now you're forgiven. And I'm forgiven. Well, we're all forgiven. Come on in. Come on in. Out of St. Pete. Wipe your feet. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Kentucky Zone, Mitch Barrett. Oh, Let's give a big virtual round of applause <laughs> for our master storyteller and musician. Thanks so much for, for performing for us today, Mitch. Um, and I wish you a, a, a continued recovery. Thank you. And I hope this year gets much better for you. Thank you. It's so good to see all you other artists. And, um, I think our world's going to change, but Hopefully it'll be to the better. We'll just keep doing what we do. Nothing's ever stopped us. It wasn't the money to start with, was it? <laughs> so we're still here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mark, for including me. Thank you. So glad you could join us. Thank you to, to Shuling Fister and to Justin Roberts as well for sharing your lives and your story with us today. Um, so wonderful to see 
the traditional arts and the folk arts thriving in Kentucky. And, and I think we all um, got, a, got a taste of how important they are um, um, within our lives today. So um, stick with us because we're gonna take about a four minute break. When we come back, we're gonna have two farmers and two community leaders named um, Ashley, Ashley Smith, and Michelle Howell. And we're gonna hear about the work that they're doing. We're gonna ex examine the connections between folk arts and farming. Can't wait to see them on screen. And I know you won't, you can't wait either. So we'll see you here in just a couple more minutes. 